beginning in verse 1. And then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. And therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why is it that you, as if he had done this, have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. And it is not uncommon and in our service to the Lord and ministry to the Lord, which will of necessity involve dealing with people and dealing with people who lose sight of grace and lose sight of God. And they're oftentimes filled with unbelief that when things appear to go wrong for them, that the first thing they will do is attack you. And it's amazing how often ministers, whatever their position, whether senior pastors or some other position, whether they're men or women, as a guise for not wanting to deal with my own unbelief, my own lack of faith in God, and acknowledging that He's put me in this circumstance and He's going to provide for me in this circumstance, I want to blame everyone around me. And it's a great mistake. And it's dishonoring to God. And this is a group of people who are in the midst of a very serious trend in their life that God is going to try to correct, but they're not going to allow Him to do it. Begin as we spoke last week. Murmuring is a very dangerous symptom of something far deeper in my life, a problem far deeper. And typically, it has something to do between me and God and a lack of faith. And they begin to blame Moses for their situation. And Moses, to his credit, does not come down to the level of the people. And that will be the great temptation. There's a mixed multitude that has come out of Egypt with the people of God. Not all of the murmurs are people of God. There's a mixed multitude that always surround any work of God. They have no relationship with God. They have no desire for a relationship with God. It just looks like an easy way to get out of Egypt. It looks like something exciting is happening. Let's join ourselves to it. But because there is no relationship with God, sooner or later there is the creation of problems. The mixed multitude is going to create great problems for the children of Israel. The children of Israel didn't seem to understand how to identify this particular group. But Moses doesn't fall down to their level. He has an office. He has a call in his life. And he represents not only himself, but that office and that call. And so he turns to God. And he cries out to the Lord, verse 4, and says, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. They're going to kill me. The temptation is to return railing for railing, reviling for reviling. But he goes to God and says, God, what do you want me to do? They're going to kill me if we don't do something. That's a very serious church split. And the people said to Moses, of course, any church split is, is dangerous when the congregation is two and a half million people. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and also take in your hand your rod, that rod that was identified with him and him alone, which you struck, with which you struck the river, and go, and behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, you, Moses, 
Not anybody else out of the two and a half million. I want you to strike the rock. Because when you strike the rock, I'm going to bring forth water. But I am going to confirm before the people. And it won't stop their murmuring, Moses. But I will confirm before the people that you are my man for this particular ministry with this group of people for all of their complaining. You shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And so Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And so he called the name of the place Massa, which means testing, and Meribah, which means quarreling, because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And what they do here, we get a little greater insight to it in the book of Deuteronomy. And the Amalekites were the descendants of Esau. They were a tribe off of the Edomites. And they kind of were a nomadic tribe that ruled this particular area of the Sinai Peninsula. They ruled that area. And the children of Israel are going through their area. But rather than come out and confront Moses, or rather than confront the children of Israel face to face, I mean power to power, man to man, they began to kill the the people who straggled behind. The older people, the weaker people, the infirmed people, those who were just tired and weary from the journey. It was a very cowardly act, what they were doing. They were doing it against God's people, and God always takes note of the fact when His people are being persecuted, because it's persecution against Him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? (laughs) Who are you? I don't even know who you are, and I'm persecuting you. The Apostle Paul, Saul at that time, was persecuting the church. And Jesus viewed it as a persecution of himself. And he came in to speak to Paul or Saul concerning that. And so here they come and they fight against the children of Israel. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Now this is interesting because up to this particular point of the children of Israel leaving out of Egypt, God has not allowed them to be confronted with warfare. He's kept things very comfortable, very protected. He's been very careful in the choosing of His trials for them. He's always fought for them in all of their battles. But they're moving on towards maturity. And so now He comes and He's going to introduce them into warfare. Going to introduce them into the battle. And there is that process that occurs in our life as Christians where just part of the maturing process is to go from where God fights all of our battles for us to where He fights the battles through us. It's a part of the maturing process. That's what He's involved in with these people as He's developing a relationship with them. Very, very often there the body of Christ, you know, there'll be that person that's a new Christian. They don't understand that one of the marks of maturity is getting involved in the battle. And that the mature person in the body of Christ isn't one who can come along into the midst of the battle that everybody else is fighting in and tell them what they ought to be doing or ought not to be doing. Or how come nobody's doing this or nobody's doing that? How come nobody's taking care of that? Nobody's doing this and nobody's doing that because we're pretty busy fighting the battle. And there is no value in the person that can only see what's wrong. And and that's fine for a time in a Christian's life. And you just change the diapers and you pat them on the head and you pat them on the bottom and you boot them out the front door and and, uh, go play in the yard. And it's okay for a while while they're learning, but it's not okay forever. 
And that kind of person is of no value. The one that can just come into a church or into a home fellowship or into this situation or that situation and all they can see is what's wrong. Everyone around them is absolutely strapped in their ministry. Serving the Lord to their fullest and, 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 and with great sacrifice. And somehow this person views themselves as being um, you know, somehow valuable. But they're not valuable in a regular war, and they're not valuable in the war that we're involved in as Christians. We become valuable, and it's a mark of maturity when I get involved in the battle. My life is yielded to Him, and He is able to now fight the battle through me. (laughs) And I am firmly convinced that an awful lot of the difficulty in the body of Christ a heavy chapter, you'll excuse me for starting so heavy, that an awful lot of problems in the body of Christ are associated with idle hands and idle minds. Too many gifts wrapped up in handkerchiefs and buried in the ground. Too much time for analyzing. We are about analyzed to death by people who don't know what it is to be involved in the battle what we should be doing and shouldn't be doing and what God is going to do and what he's all this all of this endless analysis that doesn't make any difference on the battlefield there's something about getting involved in the battle giving my life away standing in the gap for other people loving people serving the lord serving them feeding them that creates great compassion for the body of Christ as a whole. And so here they are now. He's time for them to go into the battle, time for them to learn some lessons in the midst of their first big battle. And so tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill, Moses says to Joshua, with the rod of God in my hand, representing God's power, His almighty power. I remember one time when I was a new Christian, there was a Christian television show called The Rod of God. (laughs) Boy, did that guy wail on us. I mean, he (laughs) I don't know what he thought that was all about. But anyway, and so Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand with the rod that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. And you, those of you who have ever lifted your hands over your head for any length of time, uh, you know it gets heavy, especially with something in your hand. And his hands became heavy, and so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And so here is Moses in this beautiful position, really, of prayer and and intercession. There's nothing wrong with hands being raised up to God. It's quite biblical. You'll find it all through the Bible. And his hands are lifted up, and hands lifted up, of course, is the universal symbol of Surrender. It, it, it's, a, it's an expression, even as prayer is an expression, of my utter dependence upon God. And so here his hands are lifted up with, with the rod. And as long as his hands stay up, as long as this intercession is going on, God's people prevail. And when it ceases, then they are being defeated. And I really love this picture. This is an important picture. It's a very important ministry picture. Because that victory wouldn't have been won without Moses' ministry of intercession. And he would have never been able to do his ministry without the assistance of Aaron and Hur. We're one body. We need each other. And we need each other to hold one another's arms up. It's just the fact of the matter. Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, that we are to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. One of the things that I see very refreshing in this country in these tremendously difficult economic times that we have been in for the last several years 
and the great governmental onslaught against the body of Christ and against the positions that we hold dear is that like never before in my Christian walk, members of the body of Christ in the broadest cross-section of the body of Christ are holding one another's arms up. That is good. And we need it. We get fat and sassy spiritually. <laughs> Think that we're made to self-exist. We're not. We need each other. And I think we've just begun to scratch the surface of realizing how much we need one another in the body of Christ. It's a beautiful picture. We need somebody. We need the rest of the body of Christ. And need is not too strong of a term. It's the term Paul uses in writing to the Corinthians. And notice in verse 13, so, that word so, taking us back to the intercession of Moses and, and the help that he received here through Aaron and her. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And so we see the victory won. The battle is won through the intercession of Moses, the application of the sword through Joshua. And in the New Testament, the typology... The Word of God is likened unto the sword, the sword of the Spirit. And so in our battles, which are spiritual, in the battles that God fights through us, that we're involved in, all of us involved in, whether we're involved in it ignorantly or conscious of it, the importance of prayer, intercession, and the importance of the proper application of the Word of God as it relates to the situation that's before me. The victory follows. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. When's the last time you ran into an Amalekite? They're gone. They're gone. And this is why when you read about King Saul later in the Old Testament, and he was called by God to utterly and completely destroy the Amalekites. This is why when he did not obey God's Word, it was so serious. It was serious because the Amalekites are a type of the flesh. Anytime we're moving towards the promised land or we are taking and and grabbing a hold of and appropriating the promises of God for our lives, the flesh is going to rise up against it. Again, then there's the application of prayer and the Word of God to whatever is exalting itself against what it is that God's doing in our life. But there he was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites. He did not, and he was killed by an Amalekite. God knew that you can't make treaties with the flesh. It has one goal and one goal alone, and that is to destroy you and me and our walks with God. But another reason that it was so serious, his willful disobedience to God's Word, was this here. God had said that He would utterly destroy them, and Saul's disobedience to God's Word not only affected himself, but the Word of God. And so God had to use other means to bring about the fulfillment of this passage that He inten had intended to bring through Saul. The importance of obedience to God's Word. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is My Banner. And so here he gives Jehovah Nissi, The Lord is our banner, our banner of victory, always victory in the Lord. And he acknowledges the Lord in this victory. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn... The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation because they attacked God's people, because they attacked the weak of God's people, and because they were uh, attacking, in attacking these people, in, in a sense, attacking the Lord. And he it was, came aware of it, and, and he was going to deal with them from generation to generation. And Jethro, the priest 
of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. I mean, this is a miracle. They just don't let go of two and a half million slaves. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, no doubt after that circumcision scene, with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, which means stranger, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land, and the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Eliezer means my God is help. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was camped at the mountain of God, Now he said to Moses, I am your father-in-law Jethro. I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons with her. And so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all of the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, which he had delivered, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. And so God's deliverance of these people from Egypt opens up the eyes of Moses' father-in-law who is not a Hebrew to the reality of the Lord. Yahweh, Jehovah, the true and the living God. And here he is, he begins to praise and bless the Lord that's done this thing. And then he says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. And we see the reason why God in delivering the children of Israel from Egypt took and basically disemboweled all of the gods. He showed them to be a farce in order that people like Jethro might understand that they are not gods, but that He is the true and the living God. For now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the very thing which they behave proudly, they were so proud of their God, He, Jehovah, Yahweh, was greater than them. And then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Now notice here that all men, not just the Hebrews, but Jethro also was free to enter into relationship with God. And he was free to worship the Lord. And he was free to declare praise unto God. And so this... There was no kind of a thing here in the Hebrew economy here as God was doing what it was that He was doing to make the relationship with Him exclusive to the Jews. Everyone could approach God. And God had called the Hebrew people to represent Him and His law and His nature and His holiness but also the way of of entering into relationship with Him. And that when they saw the joy and the abundant life of the Hebrews, they would want to know who is your God and how do we enter into relationship with Him. That's what God does in our life too. And so relationship with God and the means of entrance into that relationship is narrow, but it's not exclusive. So he can be nev- never be excused, accused rather, of being a respecter of persons. And oftentimes you hear it. Maybe you hold the position tonight. Maybe you're not a Christian. One of the things that bugs people about Christianity is it's so narrow. That's just so narrow, that Christianity. We're so into broad versus narrow. But the issue is never broad versus narrow. The issue is truth. What is right? What is true? 
What is the true way of salvation? And if the true way of salvation is broad, then let's get on the broad way. If the true way of salvation is narrow, then let's get on the narrow way. The issue is what is true. Not broad or narrow. Never determine whether something is truth solely based upon whether it's broad or narrow. And Jesus, without apology, said that it was narrow. It was straight. Both the gate and the road. But it's true. And anyone, anyone, anyone can walk through that gate and get on that road. The fact that it's narrow does not exclude a single person on the face of this planet. Then we could cry injustice against the God of the Christian. But no such accusation can be raised against Him. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. Oh, man. Here is Moses trying to do all of the work himself. Now, he's got a church of about two and a half million. That's a big group. That's a lot of counseling. Enormous strain here. Morning till evening, every day. And so when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, I think I like it better in the old King James where I think it says what he did to the people. (laughs) That he said, what is this thing that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone, and that's the issue here, sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening. Why are you doing all of this alone, Moses? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and His laws. And so Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. Moses, you're going to burn out. You are headed for burnout in the ministry. You're never going to be able to continue this forever. And you're going to burn the people out. You're going to become frustrated with them, and they're going to become frustrated with you. You're going to be frustrated because you never get any time to yourself to deal with what you need to deal with between you and God, and they're going to get frustrated because it's such a long line to get to you. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. (laughs) And now he's going to give him what he needs to do in order to handle this thing properly. Once any fellowship reaches a certain size, it is impossible for one man to do all of the work. I think that size is about seven. And what God must do and what He always does is He adds specific men and women with specific giftings and callings to that local assembly. And then He plants their heart in that work. They're in agreement with what's going on. They're excited about it. They're being fed. They enjoy it. It's part of their vision and what's of concern to them. And so their heart is knit with the work. And God adds these people so that the minister can then take, or whoever's in charge of the whole thing, take and delegate authority and responsibility because he can't do it all himself. I certainly can't do everything that needs to be done around here. And I haven't been able to for an awfully long time. And so there's the necessity of delegation. Otherwise, I would burn out and everyone would get frustrated with me. The transition's not always easy. There are people in this community who are very angry at me. 
because I couldn't do what they wanted me to do at a moment in time. My schedule wouldn't allow for it. But they would accept no one else but me. No assistant pastor was good enough. No elder. No anybody else had to be me. But if I spent my time as Moses spent his time here, it wouldn't be long before we didn't have a problem here. Because I would have no relationship with God. I'd get into the pulpit not having studied. You'd put up with that a few times. And then head off someplace else. And so there has to just be that time where you pull aside and you protect the time as it relates to your own individual walk with God. And then there's the delegation of responsibility. And there has to be a maturity within a body to understand that that's simply the way that it has to be. Now, you can get in and see me. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. And so there's not an isolation kind of thing. But I, it has broken my heart several times where people, something came and boy, they wanted this done right like this and it was an important thing, but it was physically impossible for me to do. Gone. And gone over the issue. Absolutely unfair. Absolutely selfish. I think that we have to be very careful in the body of Christ in this consumer-oriented society that we live in. There's a man in the fellowship who was... He owns a business here in the community. Many of you own businesses in the community. And he went to a seminar, and the seminar, one of the subjects that was dealt with in the seminar was, was what is now called vigilante consumerism. And it is now the consumer, because of the difficulty of economic time, who understands the desperation of many business owners to turn over a product, to make a deal, to do whatever is necessary to keep their doors kind of open, and they come into these businesses and they demand special treatment. They demand special prices. They want a bargain. Now, there are some areas of consumerism that's wide open to bargain. That ought to take place. But they come in with a great arrogance, ill-mannered, demanding. They want it their way. And if they don't get it their way, then they'll walk out in a huff. And if you don't want to give it to me at that price, there's plenty of other business at church in this town that will deal with me. And so we read Christianity today. We read George Barna's books. And we read how important it is that we make the church what the consumer is looking for. And that's the words, those are the words that are used. But we have to be careful because it can breed a very rude, overbearing, selfish type of Christian. I remember one pastor. I thought he handled it so well. Pastor of a large Calvary chapel who was at the back door after the service and people walking by and Hi, how you doing? And all of these things, wonderful things that occur, interaction with the pastor and people at the end of the service. There was a new couple that had come to the church and they caught him at the back door and they said to him, we just came to the church to check you out and see what you had to offer. And he looked him right in the eye and says, what do you have to offer? I thought that was wonderfully put. 
And we have to be careful because people read so many of these Christian books that treat the church like a business instead of a ministry that you can have reinforced into your heart and your mind and I can have it reinforced into my heart and my mind that all of this exists for me. And I'll find which one of these gives me the most for the least. That's fine to look for a church that meets my needs. No problem with that. But we can get very selfish and very, very sloppy. But oftentimes there's so much pressure to keep the people. Give them what they want. What do they want? They want a piece of the kingdom. Give them some area of ministry as long as we can hold on to them. We're not that desperate. And it reinforces a sinful attitude and sinful behavior and it will ultimately self-destruct because you will end up with carnal people in key positions. But that's what's going on. We need to watch out for it. Awful lot. It's very, very distant from the ways of God. He says to him here in verse 19, Listen now to my voice, and I'll give you counsel, and God will be with you. Here, Moses, is what it is that you should concentrate on as the leader, as the head guy. Here's what your ministry is about. Here is what you're gifted for. Here's what you're called to. Stay with your gifting, Moses. Stay with your calling. Don't move from it. Number one, stand before God for the people. Pray for your people, Moses. Pray for them. Don't do anything until you've prayed for them. You give yourself to the ministry of intercession for the people. Moses, that's what you're called to. So that you may bring the difficulties to God. Number two, and you shall teach them. Moses, give yourself to the teaching of the people. Just don't involve yourself with just all of the eruptions, all of the flash fires, all of the problems. Make sure that those get dealt with, but make sure that you're laying down doctrine, Moses, to the people that you are involved in preventative medicine as it relates to their lives. And that occurs through the teaching of the Word. You shall teach them the statutes and the law and show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. Disciple them in the Word of God, Moses. And number three, moreover, you shall select from all the people able men. Moses, select able men. Give yourself to prayer the study and the teaching of the Word of God, and the selection of able men. Somebody has said concerning the pastor that basically what he is in terms of the delegation of authority is just kind of a divine talent scout. He just looks at lives and fruit over a period of time to see what the calling is, to see what the gifting is. And when there's a walk that's in line with with the desire for ministry, than to give them room in that particular area of ministry. And so he was to select. He wasn't just to turn the ministry and any and every area of ministry over to any and every one. He was to select men. They were to be able men. The word able literally means powerful men, strong men. And God doesn't leave it up to Moses to then define what an able man is. Or a strong man is spiritually. He defines it here. Such as fear God. Moses, commit ministry only to men who understand that one day they will stand before God Almighty and give an answer for every word they say.
And what will be the mark of a man with the fear of God? He will be a man of truth. He will fear to give anything other than the Word of God to God's people. And make sure that they are people, men, hating covetousness. That ungodly desire for more. That's the consuming passion of their life. Why? Because they're men who have a price. And when people come before them to bring judgment related to issues or their problems or their situations, if they're more concerned about what the offering is of this individual or how much they have or these kinds of of things, if they have a price, if they want to, in their mind, even think of giving counsel other than God's Word because they might benefit by it, don't use them. And if they're given to covetousness, they'll be prone to it. So not men who are given to covetousness. In fact, they need to hate covetousness. And place them such over them, over the people. This is the kind of person that you want over people. Nothing less than that. To be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Well, we're talking about ministry just a little bit. In this ministry, no authority is given to anyone over any person's life for their spiritual welfare unless they are tested by time and their life is fruitful. If you are a Christian and you desire to serve the Lord, don't wait for someone to come up to you and give you the position over a thousand. If somebody does that to you, they certainly aren't doing it for you, does that to you, they're doing you a disservice. Begin someplace. Give your life away somewhere. And the ministry around here and serving around here, and it's not because of me, it's in spite of me. It is a joy, at least it is to me, to serve here. Because the Holy Spirit Himself keeps the whole thing together. It's a mystery. And it's because the guys that work out in the parking lot and the people who greet and the people who pray in front and the people in the children's ministry and the worship leaders and the worship leaders in the children's ministry and across the board, it's not that we put them into some pattern there and then we shoot them out of some mold. It's that there has been recognized in their life in their taking steps in ministry. It's recognized that there's faithfulness in their lives. And there's fruit in their lives. And as that is seen, greater and greater opportunity is given to that person. And all we do across the board in this ministry is we all have a true relationship, however deep or shallow it might be, but it's real, with the true and the living God, and He keeps us tuned to that one string Himself. People don't tune off of me here. We are free to listen to Him. But He keeps the whole thing together. But it begins by just giving your life away somewhere. Over five cars in the parking lot. Or whatever it might be. Over keeping the five vacuums clean in the supply room. So much that is learned there. So much that is revealed about our hearts there. And then let let them judge the people and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. What they can handle, what they can take care of, they'll do Moses and you don't have to be involved in it. And so it will be easier for you for they will bear the burden with you. And if you do this thing, and God so commands you, take it to the Lord Moses, see if it isn't Him speaking, then you will be able to endure. 
Moses, it's important for your longevity. And all this people will also go to their place in peace. Lord, it will meet the needs of the people. Your longevity and the needs of the people will be met. And so Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said, recognizing that the Lord was in it. And Moses men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. And so they judged the people at all times. The hard cases they brought to Moses. It worked itself up. If you were a ruler over five or a ruler over ten and you ran into a situation that was too difficult for you, you were free to say, I don't know what you should do. And I don't know what God's Word says for you to do. I'm going to move you to my supervisor. And they got moved up to the next group, the rulers of the 50s. It's a great arrangement. So what happens when they hit Moses? Or what happens when they hit me? And I don't know what they should do. I just keep moving them on up. And so they judged the people at all times. The hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. And then Moses let his father-in-law depart. It appears that his wife and his sons stay with him now. And he went his way to his own land. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim had come to the desert of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And so Israel camped there before the mountain, the very mountain that God had come to Moses in calling him to begin with all the way back in Exodus chapter 3 when he said, I'm going to bring you back to this mountain. God's Word is true. It's sure. And so they camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to Myself. Now he's going to ask of them obedience. But he's not going to ask them for obedience until He gives them how it is and why it is they're to obey Him. God wants our obedience to Him to be out of a response to what it is that He has done. And so He comes now to the children of Israel, even as He does in the New Testament, and He says to them, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians. You saw how I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to Myself. I brought you into relationship with Me. You saw how I did it freely. I did it graciously. I did it because I love you. Then He moves on and He says, Now therefore, as He moves on to the appropriate response, but He never brings up the response until He tells them what it is that they're to respond to. And God is going to tell them, I want you to obey me. But I don't want you to obey me because I hold a gun to your head. I want you to obey me because of how good I've been to you and how faithful I've been to you. And we're told in the New Testament, we love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. Our love for Him is completely and totally a response to His love that He first showed us. And this same principle is borne out so powerfully in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians. Where you go to the book of Ephesians and the first three chapters are filled with all of the things that God has done for us. And that first chapter is just filled with in Christ Jesus, in Christ, in Him, in Him, in Christ, in Jesus. All of the things that we have 
in Him. How richly we have been blessed in Christ Jesus. And for three long chapters, He lays out how blessed we are. He lays out what He has done for us. And only after doing that does He then in chapter 4 say, Now walk worthy. And here is the walk that is worthy of what I have first done for you. And then He moves into His commands to His people. But it was important to Him that their obedience would not merely be there. It was important to Him that they would not only obey Him, but obey Him out of the right motive. Obey out of response to Him. It's been often said, and I think well said, that the overwhelming majority of the teaching in the body of Christ focuses on what you ought to be doing for God. And here's what God says. And you should be doing it. And why aren't you doing it? Why are there empty chairs in this sanctuary? Aren't you inviting your neighbors? You call yourself Christians. I mean, this is only mildly exaggerated. But the great emphasis, what you should be doing for God, when the great emphasis of the Bible is what God has done for us, and now here is the only logical response Lay down your life as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto Him. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul writes to the Romans, and he only gets to that verse in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, after he has spent 11 chapters telling the Romans what God has done for them and the providing of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's why it says, Therefore, I beseech you. Now, in response to that, Because again, there's no longevity, certainly no longevity of joy in a walk with God where I am obeying Him because I have to, or it's the Christian thing to do. I obey Him because I love Him. And I can't believe He loves me, but I love it. And He's been good to me. He's been good to me all my life and I didn't even know it. And He's surely been good to me the 13 years I've known Him and He's certainly been good to me today. And I want to obey Him. I want to bless His heart. I want Him to be seen by all of mankind through my obedience. The one way is a life of horrible legalism and dryness. The other life is abundant life and full of joy. And now, therefore, in response, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. If you obey my voice, there is not only here the obedience, but there is, he speaks of the blessing of the obedience. You'll be a special treasure to me above all people, for all of the earth is mine. Your obedience blesses my heart, God says to them. It'll do that. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And so Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. 
And then all of the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And so Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Lord, they said they're in. They're going to do it. Everything that you say. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. I'm going to confirm your leadership again, Moses. And so Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. And then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. They're still carrying the smell and the dirt of Egypt. I want it off them. And now he's going to teach them here. They're continuing to grow in their walk with him and their understanding of of who he is. What he's going to teach them here is he's going to teach them about his holiness. He's going to give them a sense of his holiness and of their utter impurity before his holiness. They need to know that. He's going to give them the law. That's the effect of the law of Moses. To bring forth the absolute pureness and holiness and righteous standard of God. And at the same time to reveal our absolute and complete impurity before His law, let alone before Him. Is it a terrible thing that he's doing? No. That's where worship comes from. Oh boy. What do we... What can we do to get the people to worship the Lord? What can we do to get them into the worship of the Lord, the worshiping of the Lord, and and the praise and the adoration, that sense of awe towards the Lord? What can we do to get them to do that? It's, it's, It's in the hymnals. No, no, no. It's in the choruses. No, no, no. It's in banners. No, no, no. It's in dancing. It's in lighting candles. It's in liturgy. No, it's not. It is found in the sense within an individual heart of how awesome and pure and holy He is and how utterly impure I am in the light of Him and yet He loves me and He's gracious to me and He's kind to me and He's firm with me. But with that understanding of what a incredible gulf has been crossed and has been opened up. I don't know the chasm that's been bridged in the person of Jesus Christ. That understanding of how big that gulf is and how big it was. And when I understand how big it is and that He loves me and I have relationship with Him, the byproduct is worship towards Him. You can't wait to worship Him. And the biggest killer of worship today is not bad worship teams. It is man-centered theology telling you that you are great and you're wonderful and you deserve what God... How you take and, and, and how do I discover how wonderful I am and how valuable I am? I look at the cross and there it is that I discover how valuable I am. Look at what God gave and what He did for me then the cross ceases to be grace. The cross was never value for value. And if that's my attitude, 
that it was some puddle that Jesus crossed for me to enter into fellowship with God, that I was almost like God, or I am God, or I can boss Him around. No wonder why there's no worship left in the hearts of people. But where there is that sense and that understanding of His holiness, pure and white hot, and what I was, and what is yet hidden in here, you can't wait to worship. You can't wait to ascribe worth to Him and His nature and His goodness for us and who He is and then what He's done. So He's going to establish this with these people. And it's important that it be established. And then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all of the people. And you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourself that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. When Moses went down from the mountain to the people, then he went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. And then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all of the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. And then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai in the top of, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Apparently, there's people in this assembly of Hebrews Moses had told them God's Word. They couldn't come up on the mountain. They were to stay behind the barriers. But they decided that God's commands applied to everyone else, but didn't apply to them in this situation. And it threatens to kill them. The disobedience. And that type of attitude towards God's Word exists today. That's for them. I can get away with it. That's for them to have anything to do with me. And it puts me in a position of great danger. And also let the priests who came near the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come out up to Mount Sinai. Lord, they they can't get up here. You warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and sanctify. God, I, I already set the boundaries up. I told them not to come up. Surely they're not coming up. And the Lord said to him, Away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and do not do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest they break out against him. In other words, they were breaking through the boundaries. God says, I know what I'm talking about, I know what they're doing. 
Go down and take care of it again. They heard, but they didn't really hear. They heard, but they're not obeying. And so Moses went down to the people and spoke to 